like to play two clips now. The first one is Rocco Galati talking about bank bail-ins. And you want to keep that in mind when we hear about Trudeau, the Prime Minister, talking about an infrastructure bank. It's a private bank he's talking about. And that infrastructure bank will fund, allegedly, according to Trudeau's plans, the public-private partnerships where the Liberals intend to sell off Canadian assets to private enterprise. So here's Rocco Galati, a tax lawyer and has been the Colmore lawyer for the Committee on Monetary and Economic Reform. He's speaking about bank bail-ins. The second thing that people should be on notice is uh, Rob Flaherty, when he was finance minister, and Rob Flaherty, was, as, as a human being, was a sweetheart. I can tell you that from Ontario. Uh, and he had, you know, he was, he was really... Uh, a lot of his measures were never put in, even though the government uh, promised to put them in. In the last two budgets, he put Canadians on notice, you know. Uh, if I tell you that I read the budget papers every year and I look at them, uh, you probably think I don't have a life. But it's because I'm a tax lawyer. I need to know what's... Uh, I, I have an interest in this historically and constitutionally. Uh, in the last two budgets that he oversaw as finance, finance minister, how many of you heard of the term bail-in. Not bail-out, bail-in. Show hands. All right. So, uh, let, me, let me explain to you, sorry, 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 suckers, what bail-in means, okay? With the first fi financial bank crash in 2008, the governments, the U.S. and Canadian governments, bailed out the bank debt. Just gave them the money, they bailed them out. Flaherty said, never again. He put us as taxpayers and depositors on notice that we're bailed in to the bank. When you deposit $100 into a bank account, I have some news for you that you probably don't know. The money belongs to the bank. It's their money. All you get in exchange for that $100 in the contract is a promised return for the principal and interest on that money for the bank's use, even though it's only one quarter of one percent on some accounts. So, what happens if the bank goes bankrupt? Well, you as a depositor are bailed into their bankruptcy. You're bailed into their debt. And as a common depositor, you are a simple creditor under the Canadian bankruptcy laws. So you will stand in line and you will get your portion of the actual money on, this, on the system. Uh, that's it, what they call in reserve. The bank reserves right now are 2%. So for every $100 that you deposit, they're only required to keep $2 in reserve. So you will stand in line and get two cents on the dollar if a bank goes bankrupt. And all of you are saying, oh, no, 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 but I saw the commercials. My bank account, 60,000 is guaranteed by the insurance fund. That's true. But the entire global maximum of that fund nationwide is two billion dollars so maybe you'll get another quarter cent uh, in addition to your two cents that insurance fund is a placebo okay it's only two billion dollars that's nothing for a nation of 35 million people all right so understand this you are bailed in to the bank's debt and people ask me you know when i talk at conferences well, you think what hap almost happened to Cyprus could happen in Canada? Yes. I say no. It's already happened in Canada. <laughs> in 1992, in Alberta, a trust company went bankrupt. Mr. Justice Este, uh, 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 Este of the Supreme Court Justice, ran a, uh, uh, you know, an, an inquiry. At the end of the day, I think those depositors got eight cents to the dollar. So, not can it happen, it's happened, and of course it happened in the Great Depression, big time, okay? So this is where we are. Uh, so we are allowing private bankers in a foreign country 
not only to determine our banking policies and everything else, but to hold us hostage to their private profit needs. And so that's Rocco Galati on May 3rd, 2015. It's a clip taken from the Colmer versus Bank of Canada video on YouTube. And uh, I believe that's on this Altered Eagles CHLY Facebook page. I'll put it up this afternoon if it is not there. And so that's the big risk of having private banks fund the great infrastructure bank process that our dishonest prime minister is trying to push on us. I have to ask, and we should all be asking, why would we not use the Bank of Canada to borrow money under a controlled environment where we don't pay $30 billion plus dollars in interest to private banks? That's money completely wasted. Now, just to end the first hour, because we'll be coming into the second hour with Nicole Brasseur of the MyFreedom2017.com website, and the overhaul of our governance and electoral systems into a more democratic process. That's coming up in the second hour. But before we leave the first and the international kind of news, I'd like you to hear a very short clip from the Real News Network talking about the man who put Trump in power. His name is Robert Mercer. He's a hedge fund software designer, he's a billionaire, and here's the clip. The real story behind Trump isn't about Russia, it's about Wall Street, and it's about one billionaire in particular, whose political mercenaries pushed Donald Trump into the White House. Enter billionaire hedge fund manager Robert Mercer and his daughter, Rebecca. One of the Mercer's earliest activist ventures was financing a slew of fringe documentary projects that have helped raise the profiles of people like Sarah Palin, Michelle Bachman, and most notably, the director of those films, Steve Bannon. The web of connections Mercer's built over the last decade is vast and complex. It includes efforts to dismantle tax law and weaken the IRS. It's about funding quack scientists and people who blame the government for, among other things, playing a role in the San Bernardino massacre. Or of colluding with the United Nations and using climate change as an excuse to implement environmental laws meant to depopulate America's Midwest. It's about funding the Dangerous Faggot Speaking Tour, which helped popularize former Breitbart editor Milo Yiannopoulos among many college campuses. And it's about bankrolling their favorite foreign policy hawk, John Bolton, whom Rebecca lobbied vigorously for to be the new Secretary of State over Mitt Romney. Bannon. He and Robert Mercer have been close for years, and Mercer is a top investor at Breitbart News, where Bannon was chief editor. The pro-corporate advocacy group Citizens United was created in 1988, and for years it had pumped out television ads, films, and other forms of media content that sought to put pressure both on Democrats as well as more moderate Republicans to embrace a far-right, corporate-friendly approach to politics. What this right-wing trio had set out to do wasn't simply to start a business. It was to transform America's rage into a political movement that would storm Washington. One hundred one point seven FM CHLY Question Authority. And welcome back to the second hour of Altered Egos on CHLY. You're listening to Atlas Revolt on the Beyond the Pale group or CD by Ruckus. And uh, I have on the line Nicole Labrasseur. Good afternoon, Nicole. Hey, good morning, Bob. How are you? Pretty darn good. We finally got some rain here, some serious rain, and everything smells just great. Well, here it's sunny and chilly. My nose is frozen solid, so oh. if you hear me sniffling, don't ask why. Okay. Alrighty, I won't ask then. It's, <laughs> it's been a gosh several weeks since we spoke and you've been very very busy so yeah what are you up to well uh we had no choice as you know like we were part of the iq's movement which is the indigenous and civil unified sovereign enactment because first nations the nations across canada uh and canadians have to get together and, and agree to you know uh do a, some type of uh, direct democracy which is synonymous to the great law 
the Haudenosaunee Great Law, direct democracy, which is 100% consensus. Although we know we'll never reach that high in Canada, we're hoping that at least we can, uh, once we have final decision-making authority back into the hands of the people and out of our politicians who are killing this country, uh, hopefully we'll have we'll be able to make decisions according to at least 70 to 75 percent. So this way, people won't feel as though it's you know mob rule because 51 percent is mob rule. Well, you know, a lot of people have died for that mob rule. Well, uh, if we don't stop what's happening now, a lot of people will die. But in, in the matter of speaking uh, uh, from depression and, you know, not seeing any reason to live in this country because of all the stress that everybody is suffering at the hands of corporations. So what is this uh, movement you've got going, a new one called the Canadian People's Union? Right. Well, during our research, it was obvious that uh, Canada is governed under a political party system uh, because we elect our politicians. Uh, if you look at the Liberals, they are a corporate entity. The Conservatives are a corporate entity. All of the political parties. So on anything under representative democracy here in Canada or even in the world is actually... Uh, private corporations. They are private corporations handling the affairs of Canadians. And we give them that power every four years. So when we vote. So this is a big issue. We've gone through this many, many times and lots of people are aware of it. Uh, we do not have a democracy per se in Canada. What we have is a corporatocracy with a thin veneer of electoral system democracy, which doesn't really allow us to choose what we want at all. We only choose from a very fixed menu of political objectives provided by the major parties. So exactly, and, and this has happened worldwide, okay? So when we were speaking with other people from other countries, uh, I told them, I said, hey, you know, you really got to look at your system here because uh, any country that has a democ representative democracy is actually a worldwide coup d'etat brought in by the private corporations, the ones at the top, the World Bank, World Trade, the UN, uh, are all in bed in this. And this is so that they can overtake the control of every government in the world, which they are doing now through the public-private partnership. Okay, so one of the things that corporations do is they make money. And our government has been bending over backwards, frontwards, sideways, upside down ways in order to give corporations all kinds of access to valuable resources in Canada that often... Exactly often don't belong to the federal government, which is part of the democratic deficit you're talking about. So, mm -hmm. so when the government talks about making Canada number one for business, what does that mean for you and me? Uh, it means that no matter what happens within the business section, uh, they can always recoup their money through us. This is the issue of sovereign debt, right? And this is what exactly. public public private partnerships why they look so attractive to corporations because it's an endless gravy train, an endless rent seeking benefit to private corporations to get into public private partnerships. Well, what better aspect for the World Bank and the World Trade Association and all of the corporations underneath them, including the you know, I mean the U the UN is a private corporation in itself. So when you're looking at uh, Ban Ki Moon's um, uh, steering committee, okay, and what does a steering committee do but steer? Uh, this is all, you know, big name organizations like the World Trade and World Bank, uh, educate World Education, you, you name it. There, it, it, including, you know, Desmond Tutu. Uh, so when you're looking at all this, you have to kind of see the bigger picture here, because. What better way to control every government and then, you know, and, and to be able to finance projects where the, the country is liable financially to see these projects through. That's right. So this is what they've done. They've secured themselves a 100% guarantee that they could come into every person's uh, bank account or every other corporation's bank account and take whatever they want. Okay, well, firstly, is business in Canada completely behind P3s, public-private partnerships? Absolutely. Don't they realize that this is a game for the big monster corporations and that 
eventually they'll absorb every little... Well, the, the funny thing is, is as you, you, you remember, with, you know, the, when I sent you the link uh, with what's happening now with the, the smaller corporations, I mean, we're, we're not against uh, capital... All, capitalism totally we're all for employ uh, you know the people uh to capitalize on everything but you still have like the mom and pop stores and everything else that you know are struggling to survive these days like even if you're looking at uh um doctors will be affected with what trudeau is doing now to the uh, small businesses that make less than five million dollars a year uh what's going to happen to them a lot of people say well five million that's a lot well they're still considered a small organization because what the government is um funneling our money our our money to are the big corporations that are worth billions of dollars not five you know anything lower than five million so they're they're catering to the big the, the big guys and now they're going to be saying, "Oh, we're gonna we're gonna make it fair for ta- you know Canadian taxpayers." And now we're going to be taxing these uh, you know smaller um, corporations a huge amount of taxes. So now, if you're looking at what you know the the amount of taxes that these people are going to be making, well, they're in an uproar because now giving a new tax system that they're being thrown into, they will barely make it to live. So they're going to have to start laying off employees. They're the biggest ones who hire the biggest amount of people across Canada. And, you know, what's a little uh, store, clothing store, going to do when they have to lay off their people? Because now they're being taxed to the gills a lot more than, you know, than they should have been. Uh, You know, they should be taxing the big corporations, not, not the little ones. Well, it's my understanding that the tax change that Trudeau is quite adamant about pushing through would, would, I'm hearing some crazy rumbling here. I think they're doing some drilling on the outside of the building. Okay. Ah, uh, I can't hear it. Okay, well, it's, it's actually shaking my desk. So, um, small business like the doctors, and they're up in arms at the Liberal Convention in Kelowna this week. And their problem is that the federal government did allow doctors who are incorporated uh, to be able to sprinkle their income over family members who may be stay-at-home child uh, managers, etc. That's been withdrawn, is my understanding, and that's what the big uproar is about. And I don't think doctors who are the most highly paid workers in Canadian society, I don't think they fully appreciate that P3s and these big corporate inputs to Canadian infrastructure, once they get a toehold, these doctors will find themselves working for a medical corporation because this whole scene of, as you say, supporting big corporations by the federal government is not going to stop at just P3s. It's going to go into Medicare and it's going to go into education if we let Everything. it. Everything. It's, it's going into everything, every layer of government uh, governance possible, including our water, our electricity, everything. When you look at the, um, see, the thing is, is when I started looking at this, I thought, okay, P3s, they're into five-year contracts, okay. Uh, so they're saying in Canada, the government's saying, oh, some of these, you know, they're just five-year contracts to see how it goes and blah, blah, blah. When you start really looking into the Canadian Council of Public-Private Partnerships headed by Mr. John Manley, of all people, uh, who launched the Security Prosperity Partnerships for Canada, Mexico, and the United States and actually sold us out, this man, you're going to have a hard time finding him uh, even in their, their celebrations, because now they're, they've celebrated over 20 years uh, of uh, the PPPs. So you're wondering, when did this actually all come about? Well, it started back in 1993. So Mr. John Manley now has kind of switched over from the Canadian Council of Chief Executives, the CCCE, and is now the head of the CCPPP. So when you then you, you go to the international and you say, well, what's the PPP at the international? And then they'll tell you what it is. And the thing is, is you know, it's kind of ironic that we have been so asleep here in Canada that we haven't even, you know, thought anything past uh, anything more. But I'm going to read you something. And it says here, this is from the World Bank. It says, despite progress, transparent and efficient government procurement rules remain a global challenge. 
Okay, and this was their WBG report, World Bank Group report. So the World Bank Group is heavily invested in this. So they're saying, and, and this, the PPPs are about managing one corporation, managing one sector of the entire planet, let's say unemployment. One company will direct on how uh, each government should, uh, you know, implement their employees, uh, their rules and procedures, their um, how can I say, put, company policies, because they're, now they're all falling under privatization. And so you're going to see the same picture that you see in the U.K., uh, as in Canada, as in Australia, as in New Zealand, as in the United States, as in, you know, and, and this is what they're planning on doing. One company will handle one sector, and, and this is how the big corporations will have their hands on everything we do worldwide. So here it says the worldwide public procurement market is estimated at approximately U.S. 9.5 trillion each year. Of this, developing countries spend an estimated $820 billion a year worth of citizens' funds. So okay. this is the sovereign wealth that the P3 corporations are trying to get their claws into. Have already gotten their claws into. Okay. That's how late we are. It says about 50% or more of their total government expenditure on procuring goods and services that range from food for welfare programs to wiring for electrical grids that power homes and businesses. Government procurement can average as much as 16% of the GDP in the European Union to 33% in uh, Eritrea. Public procurement markets, therefore, represent huge opportunities to boost competition and economic, economic growth. Now, this is a cash cow, to say the least. For the private banks because they will be financing the corporations who are setting this up with our government. So when they set up a PPP, okay, they have to create a, new, a brand new corporation and then uh, the government says, well, the, corporate, the private corporations are taking the financial risk. They're the one, you know, uh, forking out the first amounts of money for this. And uh, so, you know, Canadians are fairly safe. Well, that's a crop because First of all, what they do is they're giving, because of these corporations being taking all the risk, they will have the voting power. So in Canada, if you look at Ontario, the, the Highway 407, which is a PPP <coughs> that they've done for many years, uh, there's a uh, Spanish company that owns 43 point something percent. The other, uh, the other one is SNC Lavin that is knee deep in this thing, uh, and they own 16 point something percent. And then you have the CPP Investment Board for Canadians who owns the other 40 percent. Well, hey, yay, you know, uh, monies will be coming back to the pub public is what they tell you. But if you look at the schematics and, and everything in uh, corporate law, the, the minority shareholders have no vote. The ones who own more than 50% will have vote. So now because SNC-Lavalin and the Spanish company own uh, 60%, they will be able to direct where all of the monies goes. Uh, if who and when who will get it and at the same time they get the benefit of being able to if the 407 if you do not pay your bill within 90 days they can revoke your driver's license and your license plate wow okay well snc lavalin and this spanish company are both involved in site c here in british columbia which is a huge boondoggle snc lavalin is being charged in several venues for bribery and it's been suggested that they actually be disallowed for business in Canada. Yes, and they're number one. If you go and you look at the uh, Canadian Council of uh, for Public and Private Partnerships, the CCPPP.ca, yep. you will see that SNC Lavin is the one that dedicated, you know, a video, a six-minute video to all of this. And they're just like thick as thieves in here because... Uh, now they will be allowed in participating in this, these P3s worldwide. And uh, nobody cares that they were caught, uh, their CEOs were caught, well, I would say SNC Lavin themselves, because they're the ones who have the keys to the bank accounts, actually paid off government officials to get contracts. So how are they getting our procurement to begin with? 
Well, when you look at the Canadian Council Chief Executives and the last probably seven Prime Ministers of Canada, uh, I think five or six have worked for PowerCore. PowerCore is the most represented corporation on the Canadian Council of Chief Executives roster list. I think they're represented in three different areas where pretty well everyone else is represented in one, and I think one other corporation is represented in two. PowerCore is represented in three. So they have the the voting power to control the Canadian Council of Chief Executives. And as I've said before, the management of PowerCore, the diaspora of the continental French family, the Desmarais, were actually given a letter of mark by Queen Elizabeth I 400 years ago to steal Spanish or so-called Spanish silver and gold that the Spanish had stolen from South and Central America. So the Desmarais were some of the first, if not the first, pirates of the Caribbean. 400 years later, they're here again controlling this country for the crown. And the crown is, of course... Queen Elizabeth II. That's the exactly. definition. Now, the, the scary thing here uh, that people need to understand is that now you have the people from the Canadian Council of Public-Private Partnerships who are now in bed in running our governance. Every in, uh, avenue of infrastructure, they are to be governing it. So even if you vote for Trudeau, he will only have a 40% say in what happens. And the thing is, is when they talk about these procurements, they never, ever talk about, they always say how great this is. Well, yeah, it's a cash cow and it's fantastic for the corporations, but not for the people. And, and we have no recourse. There's nowhere that I could find in their... Uh, 1,500 page uh, education course on the PPP uh, on how Canadians can get out of this or even our own government signing under this. How long are so, they? How long are these contracts in effect for? Well, uh, you'll have what sections of the government will say up to five years, but when you go to the CCEE, uh, CCE PPP, yep. and uh, you'll see up from 25 to 35 years. Whoa, uh, they're locking under, us in for 25 to 35, to 35 years. years. One yes. political party is dictating the next three decades of economic Bingo. plan. How the hell Bingo. does that work in a democracy? Well, and that's it. You know, they, they're saying that um, they, they, it's better for us to use private corporations because they, they can better manage their projects and our government is so incompetent that, you know, they're, they're going over budgets, everything is delayed and so you, we're better off to take public, uh, uh, private companies and to do our public procurement. So now, it, you know, what was interesting back in 2014 and especially with this Hydro One uh, fiasco and now the people only own 40% of Hydro One, 60% was sold in a PPP, okay, uh, in Ontario, and then we ended up having to pay thirty-one billion dollars more of hydro in the in a few years, which the Auditor General was totally devastated over, and said that we're going to be looking at another one hundred thirteen billion by fourteen years. So she was pissed off about this, and here is what she said: like, I've got this document from Ivy and. Uh, um, it's uh, the Lawrence National uh, Center for Policy and Management. And people have to realize that all of these corporations, these, um, you know, policy and management corporations or researching uh, organizations that are hired by these private corporations will always turn things around to make them look good because they're the ones who are paying the bill. So if you're not thinking that um, Ivy set up... Uh, this company, Lawrence National Center for Policy and Management, anything that these people are writing in reference to uh, how great, you know, that, oh, the the Auditor General is wrong and uh, we were hired by the private corporations to look into this as to what she said and uh, after uh, all of our investigations, she's wrong. However, we do agree that uh, there needs to be a uh, cost analysis involved. And, you know, so she's right on that aspect. So basically, they're trying to say, well, the Auditor General did her job, you know, in our, oh, my God, uh, she's watching out for us. 
which again, all of these things are an act. Once you start looking at the, the history and everything else, you begin to see all of these players and how they come up in their acting schematics. Uh, so the Auditor General did her job. She sound off the alarms so that they could come in and then take take out the fire that anybody might have, right? So let the Auditor General uh, set the fire, and then they will come in and take out the flame, and she's done her job. Thank you very much. So, anyways, uh, you know, I'm not being pessimistic here, uh, but the Auditor General, like, they'll, they'll problem reaction solution, right? So here in uh, December 2014, the Auditor General of Ontario uh, issued a report suggesting that traditional procurement would be superior to public-private partnerships if projects were simply managed better by government, which is, she's right. If our government was more on the ball, we wouldn't be having to go to private corporations. So instead of fixing our government, no, let's give all of our money to private <laughs> corporations. Right. Well, like, hello, right? Well, this so it could... It's, it's becoming quite clear that Canada is the outlier in democracies in the globe. Canada is the source of globalization. Bingo. I, I talked about the diaspora of the continental French Demaray family. Let's talk about John Manley just for a brief moment. John Manley is part of the old Manley lineage, which were the people who ran the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire came to an end at the end of the First World War. There were, I think, five ancient families that ran 400 million people's lives in Europe up till the end of the First World War. Those families were the Saxe-Coburg-Goth, Saxe-Coburg-Gotha family, now called the House of Windsor in England, the Queen of Canada, the absentee monarch. They are also the Hohenzollerns from Germany, the um, Ottomans, as I've said, the Habsburgs. And uh, there's one other group in there, Romanovs from Russia. So they, those four of the five were completely destroyed during the Second First World War, and only the saxe coburg gotha family emerged. And, and within two years after the end of the First War, they changed their name, if you can believe that. A royal, well, a lot of them did. A lot of them did. Well, they wanted to hide their past. And they changed their name to the House of Windsor. That sounds very English, right? saxe coburg Gotha sounds very German, frankly. And they were mm -hmm. setting Hitler up to become the tyrant he was, the fascist in Europe, and set up the Second World War within a couple years after the first. Now, all that part about the Second Wars dealt with very nicely in the book called Trading with the Enemy, written by Charles Higgum. I've written some parts or read some parts of it here on Altered Egos. I'll be reading the whole book eventually on this program. And it, it details how American companies funded Hitler, Ford, IBM, and Exxon, and a whole pile of others funded Hitler, got him going, and supported his whole operations up until 1943 when they were charged with trading with the enemy. And they were punished for that. So, right. so Canada is the outlier. It's the source of globalization. And we have, yeah. to, we have to accept this. We are being abused. Our image is being abused in the global environment. We send this pretty boy prime minister, the fascist, you know, untruthful prime minister, Justin Trudeau, off to argue with Scandinavian countries about how and why they should allow this investor state dispute resolution mechanism in free trade agreements that completely smashes democracy with a three-party tribunal meets in secret and does not divulge its results and ends up with Canada, for example, being the most sued uh, country under these so-called free trade agreements. So Canada is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah, and, and what they're doing is, is this is a trap for, uh, you know, the middle class. This is a trap for the lower, you know, the, the poor class. And, and it's actually a class war because... To, to think of it as anything other than that would be ridiculous. And the, the thing is, is, is their way of controlling, right? Sure. It's an elitist government system that we've got. We've got 300 co-opted people in Parliament. Right. So I'm going to continue with this, uh, the procurement of public infrastructure. 
uh, comparing uh, P3 and traditional approaches. And this is from the Auditor General of Ontario. Well, this is after from the, her comment, right? So they had to do a whole research based on her comment of, this, you know, saying that it's no good. Right. So they, so they needed to justify it. Right. So based on our audit work and review of the AFP model, achieving value for money under public sector project delivery would be possible if contracts for public sector projects had strong provisions to manage risk and provide incentives for contractors to complete projects on time and on budget. And if there is a willingness and ability on the part of the public sector to manage the contractor's relationship and enforce the provisions when needed, total costs for these projects could be lower than under an AFP, and no risk premium would need to be paid. So they're saying that this conclusion by the uh, Auditor General runs counter to what has become broadly accepted thinking among public sector practitioners, not only across Canada, but also around the world, that the P3 approach delivers better outcomes and does so precisely by creating incentives that spur better project performance. This is evidenced by the fact that a growing number of prominent multilateral institutions, such as the World Bank, now listen, listen to this one, This is evidenced by the fact that a growing number of prominent multilateral institutions, such as the World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, and the United Nations have created subsidiaries dedicated to capacity building in P3 procurement methods for infrastructure um, across the industrial world, countries such as the U.S., U.K., and Australia, who have applied the P3 approach intensively to meet their infrastructure needs. Now, let's not mention Canada here and all the other ones. Hmm. Okay, so this is where this is coming from, and people need to wake the hell up, because if you're running to the UN, you are entering the, the... you're, you're, you are entering the cave of the wolf, okay. and the, that's who's going to chew you up and chew you out. You know, like so, pe- people have to realize that you know these things. So, and, and why are they saying such good things about this? Well, again, it's you know to make sure that oh well, people are wrong, and look at the AG; she was wrong. So, because she said that, we made sure that we fixed up. Uh, you know. Uh, to make sure that it was cost effective and uh, all of these implementations. Well, let me tell you, if the financial markets drop tomorrow, what happens to these P3s? Exactly. The Canadian citizens will be in hawk to their ear, up to their ears to the private banks for these loans because we are part. Uh, one of the reasons why we can't even fight these P3s is because we are place as minority shareholders with less than 50% say and actually have no say and who are we going to sue ourselves? Well, P3s are for corporate profit, not for public benefit. And a big study, exactly. a, a big study out of Australia which I'll send you a copy of made that abundantly clear. And we've done studies in North America and seen the same thing. In Europe as well. P3s are on the decline for our fossilized prime minister to start to dredge them back up is totally unconscionable. He's a traitor to working people in Canada. And so why would we not use the Bank of Canada for that project? Like, that's a no-bloody-brainer, you know? Why would you want to borrow at interest if you're actually working for the people of Canada? He is not. That's obvious. Yeah, uh, definitely he is not. And every time that he speaks, And this is what I do. There's an exercise that people really need to focus on. And it's that when they listen to Trudeau or any uh, political party speak, it doesn't matter who it is, because let's not forget, they are all part of this corporation. They are all part of this plan. There's no NDP that's going to come and save the day. There's no conservative that's going to come and save the day. They all work for the same people. Okay, one thing you did say is that we are minority shareholders. Now, firstly, before I get into this next part, I want to make it clear to everyone who's listening that if you have even 49.9999%, somebody's got 50.1111%, right? And so Mm -hmm. in a boardroom, it is not the process of finding conciliation and everybody finding agreement. 
It's winner take all. It's like first past the post election. So if you have 50.111%, you will always win in that boardroom debate. So if we are minority shareholders, you once said that there is power for minority shareholders to put the brakes on programs that their executive are offering so that they can study those programs better. Can you speak a little bit to that, or is that it? Yeah, this is the reason why we launched the Canadian People's Union, Freedom 2017, because uh, the reason why the people need to join this is because now that they've actually placed us as minority shareholders under we are governed under corporate law and we can only fight them under corporate law otherwise they will throw you under the bus to the charter of rights and freedoms and you can only speak for yourself and not the rest of canadians so under corporate law though we can go in there if we have enough people and I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of people need to sign up to the union if we're going to make an impact because we can go in there and say, hey, we're the minority shareholders, and under corporate law, as it exists today, uh, minority shareholders have, then the judges have the right to come in and place a moratorium when the minority shareholders have a complaint, a serious complaint. Right. So, right. so this is the only time under, and this is why the courts cannot, uh, our governance system is not justifiable. So the, the courts cannot interfere in the way that we do our governance here in Canada, which is a corp by a corporate entity. We can, they can only come into it because under the Corporations Act, there is a clause to protect minority shareholders when the top ones are doing something they do not approve of. Well, many people have hear, heard the book or the movie called Minority Report. And that's very, very similar to what you're talking about. In, I believe it's Robert's Rules of Order for managing board meetings and assemblies, deliberative assemblies in the Western world. If you're a minority on a vote, like I was just mentioning in a moment ago about uh, the 50.111% always get what they want, while the 49.999% can file a minority report. And, and that yeah. can be part of the minutes of that meeting. And it, it would explain why they're opposed to what's going on. So there is that powerful potential. You know, how many people who take corporate law take it to deal with politics instead of making money in a corporation somewhere? They never. And this is why people are so disconnected from the fact that we are ruled under corporate law. Okay. Nobody thinks about that. And because, oh, that's for business. No, 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 no. That's how you are ruled and governed. Okay. So, so if, would we be better off to get involved with the BRICS group, the Brazil, Russia, oh, India, hell no, China? Oh, no. Well, first of all, first of all, Bob, what does the BRICS, what is the BRICS? The BRICS is supposed to be set up for, uh, you know, countries who are financially strapped and who can borrow money at a cheaper rate than they can from the IMF, Okay. That's the, that, that's the thing with the BRICS. First of all, in Canada, we don't need to borrow anything from the BRICS. So get the BRICS out of your head because we have enough natural resources and human resources that we would never need the BRICS unless these P3s throw us under the bus with our government and we're going to have to declare bankruptcy. Well, the other thing uh, to remember is that we have the Bank of Canada. It's still a legal entity. It has not been disbanded through Parliament. The Bank of Canada Act of 1937-38 still stands. I'm, a, I'm amazed that nobody in Parliament has stood up and said, well, you know, don't you think we should save our constituents at least $30 billion a year of interest to private banks and we should borrow from the Bank of Canada for these P3 alleged infrastructure investments we could do it all through the bank of canada we don't need to have private banks get involved at all and we can manage snc lavalin and spanish or whoever else to do this work properly when you have that kind of borrowing capacity at zero interest rate from the bank of canada you can bring on board people who do know how to manage big industrial operations when we well, see bob no offense here but to think that somebody in Parliament could stand up and do that, do that, unless they want to look good, 
okay? They can say a lot of things that, oh, yeah, this guy really wants us to stop this and, you know, and reinstate our bank. But in the end, they will, as a group, they can't. Well, I believe Why? that. I believe because that. I believe that exactly. because they're, they're members of a corporation they've signed Bingo. on to, right? They've signed exactly. on saying they will not go against policy. You know, what we need is to bring some of these documents they sign on air and read them and see how well, restrictive look, they are. If you look at the, the Liberal uh, Party's uh, Constitution, I mean, it's over 80 pages. Well, sure, but that's so. the Constitution. That's not the contract. I bet there's a contract with a member that they bring in to run in a riding. They sign a contract. I'll bet you dollars to donuts on that. All oh, right. You know? Yeah. So course. you've got a constitution, and the contract will reflect what's in the constitution, but it's the fine mm -hmm. print, as it always is in contracts, that are not in the constitution. They yeah, are the, well, they are the rules. Who puts these people in power to begin with anyways, and who funds them but the corporations? And then they have to be part of the corporate... Uh, you know, the private corporations and, you know, the, the uh, Canadian Council of Chief Executives and because they're executives themselves within the Liberal Party and then the Conservative Party and the NDP Party. And the, the best way that you can know if your representatives are working for you is if you look at right now, all of the Liberal uh, premiers, okay, in the provinces, they still fall under the, the same political party structure. Okay, a liberal is a liberal, whether at the provincial or the federal level. The only thing that makes them uh, different in distinction is right now uh, Trudeau has all the power because uh, eight of his MPs are liberals. Now, if you look at the other ones, okay, Notley, uh, if you look at um, Strahl, all of these people, these you know, whether they're independent or NDP. In their provinces, they could have given direct democracy to their people. They could have stopped all these things from happening, yet they haven't. Instead, they are the same voice as the liberals. So if you can't see that they are all in bed together, you are blind as a bat. Well, the best, and, the best way to look at that, I think, is to see what the outcomes are in the various provinces, and especially for essential items like food, education, health care, and utility power like electricity how could we have these incredibly badly designed economic fiascos going on in like four or five provinces simultaneously like, like what is this something well, some kool-aid they had at a house no, of commons but, meeting or what is going on but but bob like i was explaining to you back in 2011 okay harper and obama and all of them got this memo uh you know from the unpan and this is for globalization. So from the UN. And their instructions were, well, you know, um, the, the people have to really hate their government. And uh, then we're going to need some new blood to come in for the people to like and to have hope in. And to start, you know, making them think that they have a democracy. So now because they hate their government, you have to go in there and have them like you. So... Uh, so now Harper and Obama both and, and everybody else in the other countries launched what you call the open government program, right? They, I have screenshots from 2011 uh, where they started um, putting on the Canadian website uh, the open government. And then in 2013 or 14, this little NDP says, oh, we need open government and honesty and, you know, get people's opinions. And so he was hailed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at the NDP. has got a nice idea. And then nothing was said about it. And then all of a sudden, Justin Trudeau runs for election. So uh, it's like they were trying to decide, okay, who's going to come in next? NDP or will Trudeau finally, you know, say yes and, you know, use him be to finalize what his father did, uh, you know, under treason for the Canadian people. Mm -hmm. So, I, I just added that. That's but good. Anyways. I like it, actually. I can hang on that for minutes. Yeah, so anyway, Trudeau comes in and says, Oh, look at how great I'm going to be. We're going to give you open government. All along, the website has, had been there by Stephen Harper in 2011. Now, if these people are not all in the same bed together, and this is all mastermindfully done by the United Nations and the private corporations who own the United Nations, and I say this because if the Federal Reserve in the United States is owned by private people, so is the U.N. 
So you just need to connect the dots, connect the money, uh, follow what's being said. Now, coming back to the BRICS, we'd be ridiculous to even support that because it actually came from the IMF. People need to start reading their shit. Because if you don't look at everything around the world that's happening, you can't connect the dots. You're going to make bad decisions and you're going to get caught in their snares. So, you know, right now you've got tons of people fighting all kinds of different issues. You know, uh, taxation now for the doctors, um, you know, the, the smaller companies. And then you have uh, vaccines, chemtrails, tar sands, everything. If we don't all get together under the Canadian People's Union, we are doomed. Because nothing in law supersedes the will of the people. So we already have the Convention of Consent that people need to sign, as well as join the union, because we need to come at them from all sides. And the only way that we're going to win is through the voice of the people, not what the courts would say, because the courts, in the end, will have to agree that, yes, and they've said so themselves in not so many words. Until we democratically change uh, our governing system, nothing can change. Uh, you know, we're supposed to, we are the uh, shareholders of the Crown Corporation, but until our governing bodies go and change the text in our Constitution to reflect all of the changes they've made in 150 years, we're still bound by those stupid rules that actually will get thrown out because all of a sudden the Canadian government government comes in and says, well, I'm sorry, you lost your case because we appealed this 20 years ago and you should have known about this if you would have done your research, and but you didn't know, so hey, this case, you know, we win. Yeah. And you lose again. So how are we ever going to win anything if we don't clean up the mess within our constitution, our governance, and it needs to be by the will of the people because nothing else will win this thing. Well, they've divided that will quite nicely, have they not? By making, exactly. We have, by having people chase chase their tails under different agendas. Yeah. Oh, they're fighting this. They're taking that to court. They're taking yeah. this to yeah. and and they've got everybody separated, segregated. Now hating each other under um, you know hating Muslims for no reason because who did this but our own government? Everything that happens in Canada is at the hands of our politicians who are run by private corporations who are taking over this planet who devise a voting system that is all corporate in order to do a coup d'etat over all the citizens of the world if we don't wake up now we're in deep shit and i'll tell you something right now they've got a flash sale going on in canada if you go to uh the canada government website under invest in canada Think Canada, July 2017. This was prepared by the Investment Strategy and Analysis Division, Office of the Chief Economist, Global Affairs Canada. Now, why should we trust the economists of today who actually sunk us in 20 to 2008? Why are we still listening to these people? I have no clue. But anyway, moving on. What they say about Canada, Canada is number one in the world right now in the G7 and the G20 for real GDP growth, uh, for um, Canada's strong economy, for Canada, lead, Canada leads G7 countries in long-term GDP growth. You're still there? So, yep. Yeah, I'm still here. And it says, you know, uh, so Canada is number one and for business. So when the government talks to, talks to the Canadian citizens, they're talking about our financial economy. They're talking to the corporations. They're talking to the Canadian shareholders of these corporations, not the people. How many people do you know who own bank stock? I don't know I anybody. Know. I don't know anybody. The people who invest in the stock market are the old money, the ancient money, and some new super wealthy that just hit the right button at Facebook or Google or whatnot. Uh, very, very few people who are working class people get wealthy in this country. It's old money recirculating. It's money for nothing people. The elitists who get their incomes paid for through stock market deals and they get to lean on governments to make sure they have an endless supply of sovereign wealth income at least. So that's right. part of the problem. And a good way to deal with this is to identify these ancient families and to see where they're connected. You know, a recent, some recent reading I was doing about uh, Thomas Jefferson and uh, the name Gordon Cummings, Gordon-Cummings, a family name, came up. 
And it's an old English name. And earlier in this show, in the first hour, I talked about Cummings Diesel putting out their first electric semi-truck, right? Cummings Diesel is the Cummings family from way back in the day. That's just one other example of how the elite have been going multi-generationally, getting all the good jobs and getting all the investments because who else has the capital to invest? I mean, we're into, what is it now, seven years of austerity in Canada while we still have GDP growth? Like, that's an, ox- right. that's an oxymoron if ever there were one. You, yeah, well, you- well, that's, Bob, you know, not to cut you off here, but one of the things, we're kind of running out of time there, but one of the things that people need to understand is that when they're, you know, uh, with Brexit, that's another con job being played on the people. Because these people, if you look historically, they will never give you a referendum to create an outcome that they don't want. I hear you. They will give you a referendum from an outcome they want. So now, Brexit. The UK is out of Brexit, and now the UK is going to join the BRICS. Yeah, I was the IMF. Yeah, the IMF said themselves that they need to come up with a new monetary system so that they could uh, transfer over. Why? Because they want to kill this system so that they come up with a new, you know, because there's too many little millionaires walking around on this planet. And if the little millionaires get together, they can wipe them out. Well, I read. So they need to wipe out the little millionaires. I think the BRIC system is the elites in those countries trying to get a better seat at the table of the global, international, Rothschilds controlled central banking system. That's what's going exactly. on. Exactly. And if we're going to a cashless society. That's what they want. I mean, if you look at what Russia is starting to look towards seriously on well, the stock who's market. Who's the grandfather of a cashless system but John Manley? People need to start knocking at this guy's door. He's the one behind everything. They will never put him, his face in a video from what I've seen. And, you, you know, you really got to research. But his name is always there, you know, when they created the North American Union, the book, uh, like over 400 pages. And then in there they had a cashless system and it was going to be called the Amero, not not a new money, not a new dollar. It was a actually actually a cashless system. And now all of a sudden, poof, Bitcoin shows up. Nobody knows who really created. Now you've got a few guys trying to claim it. But <laughs> no, no, they never do anything. This is a Delphi technique, and we need to bring this in. Because what is a Delphi technique? They will give you uh, different choices, but only the choices they want you to make. Okay, never, it's like proportional representation. Uh, they're going to, oh, we're going to change the system. We're going to offer you proportional representation. And then they turn around and say, no. Well, guess what? They want you to want proportional representation because, oh, well, daddy said no, so now you're going to want it. And this is all a mind game they are playing because the Delphi technique, they will say, okay, choose A, B, C, or D, but you can't have anything else. They will never give you direct democracy. Why? true direct democracy I'm talking about where the people are the final decision makers in this country and this is what needs to happen because we are the final decision makers and we need to lift our boots up by the straps and start walking in our boots the way we're supposed to be and become you know adults that don't need to be pacified walking around with a soother in our mouth going nung, 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 you know and always oh, make my decisions for me no we're in trouble here and we need to take action. Everybody needs to get on the same page, on the same agenda. And everybody needs to get together under this union and actually do something right before it is too late. So now, the, you know, with, with all of these mechanisms they've put in place, like the Delphi technique, these PPPs, and, oh, it looks good, and, you know, people are stupid if they think it's not good. No, no, no. How I want to know how I can get out of this mess and the Canadian citizens and this government, if all else fails and they go over budget and they need more money and all of a sudden we've become Greece here where the IMF can take us over and all the world, the world banks and all the banking groups who are funding these corporations and getting a guarantee of the Canadian natural resources for payment for this shit. Okay, so, so where can people get access to the Citizens Declaration of Consent if they choose to sign it? They can go to MyFreedom2017.com and uh, read about our union. You can read our mandate, which is about everybody ta- everybody doing our due diligence and taking a step together in changing uh, Canada for the people. 
and, and not for the private corporations. Although we can help all of the corporations in Canada prosper, we need to do this together. But the people need to rule, not the other way around. Okay. Well, always a slice to have a few words with you, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I thank you very much for tearing the scab off so that we can start to heal it properly this time around. It would be such a shame if Canada came so close to a democracy only to have it snatched by a lying prime minister and 300 co-opted members of parliament when we could be free and clear and a leader of freedom and sustainable development in the free world. So, Yeah, because... Bob, Canada is number one in the world right now with potential, and that's why they're all jumping onto the bandwagon. It is a, a flash sale, and we need to stop this sale from happening, and we need to do it now, not tomorrow. People need to go to their computers, sign up, and do it today, and get everybody involved. Otherwise, we're sunk. Okay. Excellent. Thank you again. Thank you. And we'll talk to you later. Take care. Ta take care as well. We'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. That's Nicole Labrasseur. Go to www.myfreedom2017.com. Look for the Citizens Declaration of Consent and get on board with building a true democracy in a world where democracy is definitely under attack on all levels, on all fronts. So you're listening to Altered Egos on CHLY 101.7 FM in Nanaimo. Coming up next is the Masthead. And we'll go into some business material right now. Thank you very much for listening to Altered Egos. I'll be here again next week, 10 till noon. Take care. Put your gumboots on. Remember, resistance is creativity, and creativity is resistance. Bye for now.